was in the first uh, five or six games. And then he pulled his hamstring, missed, you know, a good third of the season, and then uh, came back and made an enormous catch in overtime in the playoff game to uh, set up Kyle Rudolph's fate that was such an egregious push-off, apparently. So, uh, uh, you know, he, and he's done it again this year with, you know, aside from COVID taking him out last Sunday, he's been – Super productive again. So that's uh, Kirk Cousins talking about his favorite set of hands on the Vikings. Uh, Adam Thielen, Courtney Cronin joins us on today's episode of Purple Daily from ESPN.com. It's Mackie, it's Judd Declan producing. And uh, Courtney, can we start off by just getting like what is the what's the current state of of Viking skill position players? Like how broken is Dalvin Cook? Uh, I, I, we loved his answer by the way. I think it was to Chris Thomas, and we basically yeah. down on Zoom. It was like. Well, would you ask Derek? Would you ask Derek Henry that question? And the answer is obviously no, because Derek Henry doesn't have the injury history. Like, look, like I think what Dalvin's doing is great. I I love the fact that he is so such a heavy believer in his own ability to bounce back and all that. But every time he's gotten hurt this year, it looks like it's a gate season ending injury. Think about the groin in Seattle that obviously kept him out for a game and a half, but there have been little stingers he's had here and there. I mean, he couldn't walk off the field. Like he had to have two trainers with him. It was, very, it was very Paul Pierce Eastern Conference playoffs. Like <laughs> yeah. they like stretchered him off and he came back a minute later. Yeah. Like what was the thing? It was in a World Cup game. Was it Germany? The girl who like um, she came out. She like had to get helped off the field. I thought it was in a stretcher and then she got off and she ran around and she like went back in. Yeah. Like <laughs> I just exactly you know. what it was. You're right. <laughs> and and I know that like you know. The, the workload issue, I mean, Gary Kubiak's the one who talked about it. That's how the, the issue came up, that, you know, Dalvin's a little beat up right now. Well, yeah, of course. Like, I mean, he's carrying the ball, like, an absurd amount of times. He's averaging the most touches per game. He's on pace to eclipse 320 this season. Um, there's going to be concerns about the durability. And, like, Dalvin gets like this because I remember last year when he – messed up his shoulder or whatever the last two weeks of the season he missed the green bay game and he missed the game against chicago and another starters played he got a little snippy with the media asking about this and i'm so sorry but like you have injury history they just paid you a bleep ton of money to be here beyond this season so it's an absolutely fair question to ask about your workload and how your body feels right now given you have all these other years left on your contract where you're supposed to be the same version you are now, how is that going to, like, I think it's a completely fair question. And yeah, you're right. We won't ask Derek Henry that question because he has not been hurt. I'm sorry. That is just a freaking fact. And I think that's kind of the frustrating part of it. Cause like you wonder like, well, why aren't the Vikings trying to be a little bit more cognizant of this? Um, I mean, if Kubiak saying, yeah, he's a little beat up, we need to, you know, freshen him up a bit, whatever that means. Um, you know, why haven't you? I mean, he ran the ball like he tried his hardest against Carolina and they keyed in on the run. It's what opened things up for Justin Jefferson, you know, the three other receivers who had seven catches each. Like it's a lot, but like I think that you have to find ways to preserve him in certain games or in certain moments because you're going to wear him into the ground. This is a human body we're talking about. He's not a robot. No, I, he's a no, he's it. a football robot, Cardi. Football. The, the head coach, I got bad news, doesn't give a damn. Exactly. Like, that's the thing I think people don't Coop understand. Like, they're going to run him. They're Coop gonna... has probably told Mike, you know, a hundred times by now, Mike, we can't continue. And Mike says, I don't don't care. But here, here's the one thing. So uh, this happens when Courtney Cook gets hurt. And I think we need to uh, at least potentially have our hand on the alarm because we're not talking about it because he's been hurt. Or he, you know, uh, the fumbles, the fumbles, any, consi anything. I mean, when Adrian Peterson did this, any consistent type of fumbling becomes a problem. Yeah. And, and I don't, and I don't think I'm not saying that he wasn't hurt against the Panthers, but I will throw this out. I don't think it is a complete coincidence that when he does fumble and often loses the football, that we see him stay down and act like he has been devastatingly hurt and then come back. So um, mm -hmm. the fumble to me are something that need to be cleaned up very quickly here because against a team like Tampa or the Saints, that's the exact type of, of thing, just like special teams goofs, that will cost you football games. Sure. And I mean, I'm fairly certain in Seattle two years ago, or, or I guess that would have been last season, that was, you know, the issue when he went down there and fumbled. I'm fairly certain that was the case. And then, you know, 
I, people have brought it up to me and you can't speculate. You can't be like, Hey, Dalvin, were you faking an injury because you were afraid of getting, you know, your butt chewed by Mike Zimmer for, for fumbling? Like there's a lot of speculation about that stuff, but I think that, you know, the optics of it, Judd, you're right. I mean, it doesn't look, I, I don't, it's not that I don't think Dalvin would do that. Just knowing him, I don't think he would no. do that, but you know, there have been people who brought up like, is this Xavier Rhodes part two? that every time he gets hurt or nicked up, he freaks out. And he said he freaked out because he was in the pile. And if you watch the video, Trey Boston's pulling for his ankle. It's very obvious. Like people do dirty stuff down in the pile. They try to punch you and pinch you and all this weird stuff. I mean, it's uncomfortable. And so he said, he's like, yeah, I kind of freaked out a little bit at first. Um, But then you see him running up and down the sideline after he had a, you know, excruciatingly long couple minute long stay in the, medical tent like you're, everybody's kind of holding their breath is he coming back is he you know can he walk like because he couldn't walk off the field by himself and then he's jogging up and down the sideline like I understand why fans were like this is Rhodes part two that every injury is you know like he's you know lost a body part and then he's fine like you know Xavier with the third quarter cramps uh exit that he always had in Minnesota especially last season I don't think we're doing seeing that with Dalvin Cook. I think it's honestly somebody who gets a little gun shy anytime something doesn't feel right in the moment and maybe not think like, you know, not in real time reacting to it and not giving it the time to be like, okay, I'm fine. I just need to like get up and walk this off the whole thing. But he was limited in practice, um, you know, this week. And I think they're going to try to be cautious with it because this is the stretch of the year where he got hurt last year, missed two games. Um, and it, it's, you know, they need him. If they're going to make the playoffs, they need him to be healthy, but it's a double-edged sword. You cannot run this guy into the ground and expect him to be healthy. Like I just, you know, I think, I I don't think that like work workload is a swear word or, you know, work, you know, work management on a player, like, you know, managing a player's snap. It's not a bad thing. Like, you know, it's not an insult to you as a player, Dalvin, that we're that we're bringing up the question of like, man, do you really want to have this guy run the ball 30 times a game? Oh, it's looking out for the longevity of your career and wondering, can it be sustainable? Yeah, it, it feels it, it not just feels it is much more acceptable in NBA circles with superstars like load management. Load management game, yeah. Right? And the NFL, it's it's like I think you nailed it. It's like. It's like questioning your manhood, especially mm-hmm. if you're a running back. Like, what do you mean? Are you, are you, his reaction on that Zoom was, was literally like, are you questioning? He didn't say this, but he's like, are you questioning if I'm a man? Well, like, like that's I, if I'm tough about. enough to handle it, like, yeah. you're, not, you're not questioning Derrick Henry if he's tough enough to handle it. And those were not obviously his exact words, but that's how it comes across. And yeah. he knows what he signed up for. He's a running back. You're going to get the crap beaten out of you. I get that. But it's like, being smart about it, not just running 150 miles an hour into a brick wall. Like think about how you might be able to do this differently. And of course, I I just think it's kind of weird because Mike Zimmer constantly deviates to, or, you know, well, you know, he said he wanted to go back in the game. He said he was fine. He said this, he said that, well, what the hell? Like you're letting the player decide everything now. That seems kind of like, you know, I don't want the responsibility. I'm not the one forcing him to go in the game. I mean, that's just how it comes across. Like, I don't, I don't think that, you know, it should be completely up to the player, especially when you're trying to focus on the playoffs and getting through these next five games. You know, Alexander Madison touched the ball very few times in the win over Carolina. I think that's kind of disgraceful at this point. Like, why do you have this guy here if you touted him as such a great backup when he's not – either he's not or you're really, like, not seeing this thing clearly and – using him the way that he should be used as a backup to spell your running back. I mean, you've only been talking about it the whole season. Why have you not done it? So, so here's, here's the question that I think I'm, I'm keying in on the next month or so Mm -hmm. Vikings came out of the bye, and they, and they went back to the drawing board offensively and said, all right, some of this like Kirk threw 10 picks, whatever it was, 11 picks, 10 picks before the bye week. Let's just get back to handing the ball off and, and making sure that Kirk doesn't make a mistake. Let's start there against green Bay and see what happens. And so, their formula for so they've won four out of five games. Their formula starts off: Kirk throws fourteen passes. Vikings beat the Packers by a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Kirk throws twenty passes. Uh, they beat Detroit, even though they gave up two block punts by two touchdowns. Now we've gotten to Kirk. You know, Kirk's throwing the ball in the fourth quarter against Dallas. Kirk's throwing the ball forty-five times against Carolina, in part because Dalvin got hurt. If Dalvin Cook either has to have reduced workload or miss a game or two as they fight for the playoffs. Can the Vikings still perform at a really high level offensively in your mind? If it's Kirk, 
needed to throw the ball 40 or 45 times against uh, the majority of these next few opponents. Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, I'm not what Kirk did in one minute and 51 seconds with no timeouts. Like that's impressive regardless of who it's against, but everyone's holding their breath there. If Carolina hits that 54 yard field goal game's over and they win. Like the fact is like Carolina was a bad defense and it got worse as the game went on. They're bad offense and they got worse as the game went on. They're held to two field goals there in the second half when in, in, you know, obviously the muffed punt, like they had a chance there to go up and they settled for a field goal. Like, the, the numbers that you're seeing, he's NFC Offensive Player of the Week and, you know, what he did in the fourth quarter, all that stuff is great. But, like, let's just be real about this. Who is he doing it against? They have beaten one team with a winning record. That's Green Bay. You have beaten up on other teams, like, that are just not very good. Houston, not very good. Detroit, awful. Chicago, even worse. Like, I mean, you should have beaten Dallas and they have a losing record, but with, you know, the Carolina Panthers are not a good team. I don't, I don't know. Don't sell me on that. Like they're not a good team, but the fact that he got into essentially a drop back game there and had to go win it for them dictated the fact that he had to throw the ball 45 times. And because they were keying in on the run and taking away Dalvin cook, I think that's a doable thing for the Vikings, but you know, that's going to require the full, like the full plethora of your offensive weapons, like meaning Thielen needs to be back in order for that to happen against good teams. I think you can get away with that against bad teams Um, because you know that you're just going to be able to like outlast them essentially because their defenses are going to break down, which we saw against Houston, which we saw against Detroit, which we saw against, you know, Chicago once they lost to Keem Hicks, completely different defense. I mean, like that's just, that's, that's a common theme here. No one's talking about like that, you know, why are the numbers the way they are? Why is Kirk performing as well as he is? Like, I will shut up and I will never say another word. Do this against Tampa Bay. Do it against the Saints. And then I think we have a completely different, you know, prove that you can beat good teams because you're not going to last in the playoffs if you can't. And you, you've got to beat the Cowboys, too. Like, I mean, well, yeah. this, this, should be, this should be three uh, consecutive wins at home. Now, here's my question, because th- this gets this delves into the psyche of the Vikings and what I think is the most important thing, and it involves three people. It involves Gary Kubiak, Zimmer, and mm-hmm. Kirk. Does Gary have the ability to convince Mike that they are going to remain a run-first team while actually morphing it into what could have to be, to Phil's point, a pass-first team? And more importantly, do both of them have the ability to make Kirk believe that Dalvin is still the show and the pressure is off Kirk because I, I I think the one thing that flips is if you go to Tampa and you're like, you know, Kirk, you're playing great and we need you. Kirk is going to freak out. Mm-hmm. So I think what this is, is is a manipulative way that Gary has to work uh, Mike and Kirk like puppets here for them to believe that they're getting what they want or that the pressure is not dialed up. Um, because I think if we flip the script now and we go, hey, Kirk, great job, your game. Kirk freaks out. And if Mike thinks that, Mike freaks out. So I really think that Gary is the linchpin here as ha- having to be the adult in the room to mm-hmm. convince everybody that they're getting what they want or they're not getting too much on their plate while orchestrating things like Gary wants. Yeah, I think Gary does have a lot, like pulls a lot of weight here. And I mean, he called a really good game on Sunday, especially when Thielen's not there. You know, I think the one thing that you should be worried about is when Thielen comes back, does it does all of the progress that we saw in week 12 out of necessity, where Kirk's spreading the ball around, does that all go away and Kirk goes back to zeroing in on Thielen and Jefferson has something like five targets? That can't happen. Um, and I asked Kirk about that this week, and he's like, well, that's really a question for the offense coordinator that's on play calling and where they, you know, where his reads take him are, you know, apparently from the play caller. I understand that, but you need to have, like, that's what I worry about. Like, once Thielen comes back, like, does it revert in crisis mode to I'm just going to force the ball to Adam Thielen? Um, you know, if they could have a consistent approach where there's a lot of play action dropbacks or, you know, shots off play action to get Kirk comfortable at first, because that's what you didn't see against Dallas until much later. And I think that was part of the reason why they lost. Like they just didn't have him in a rhythm. Like you can win games and you can, you know, use the run effectively, but not have it be, you know, what you're doing every, you know, pass, pass on first down, use play action on first down, do the things that you just don't typically do because then you're less predictable. And honestly thinks it helps kind of with the whole longevity process or, you know, the whole thing with this offense. Uh, I want to play a clip for you guys. This is again, this is Kirk cousins from Pat McAfee show yesterday. And this is 
just Kirk talking about the great rookie season from Justin Jefferson. Then I have an interesting article to bring up. Natural is the word I've used. You know, people ask me kind of what has made him successful. And it's not any one trade. It's not, oh, he's a 4 2 40 guy, so he's just faster than everybody, and that's why. Or, oh, he's big and strong, and so he just outmuscles people. It's really neither of that. It's he, he's just a natural receiver. So tracking the football comes easy for him, closing on the ball. Um, you know, attacking it with his hands, creating separation versus man coverage, and then running the entire route tree. There's not a route that, you know, he, he's uncomfortable running. So, so um, those are all very true things and, and high mm-hmm. praise for Cousins. And then I saw this article from Aaron Schatz on ESPN.com. He's a football outsider. He's the, the, essentially the creator of Football Outsiders, mm-hmm. a deep dive uh, statistical heavy football analysis. And he has the 10 greatest rookie wide receiver seasons going back to 1985. And he listed a bunch of numbers, but he's basically going off of what's called yards above replacement. And however they quantify that behind the scenes, number 10, Ernest Givens Tecmo Super Bowl hero, by the way, Ernest Givens Oilers, 1986, AJ green Bengals, 2011 Juju Smith Schuster, 2017 Steelers is, is eighth. Lee Evans. Remember him? Wisconsin Badger yeah, Lee Evans good. with the bills in 04. Oh yeah. Keenan Allen, Chargers, 2013. Michael Clayton, Buccaneers, 2004. That was pretty much his peak. Uh, Odell Beckham Jr., fourth on this list. Randy Moss, 1998 rookie season, third, which might make people be like, well, who the hell are the top two then? Number two, Michael Thomas, Saints, 2016. And according to Football Outsiders, Justin Jefferson is projected to have the greatest rookie wide receiver season since 1985. Your it's thoughts. wild. I mean, that's wild. And I don't think we should be that surprised um, knowing what we know now. And Kirk, I mean, Kirk said the same things over and over again. Like he is a natural receiver. He tracks the ball while he runs a full route tree. I mean, those are things that you expect from receivers coming into the NFL. But I think you'd be surprised how few and far between you get as a, as a polished product coming right into the league, their rookie season. And that's what we saw once they took the training wheels off Jefferson in week three, um, BC Johnson went back into the depth, like way down the depth chart, like didn't see him until week 12 out of necessity. And Jefferson did exactly what he was brought here to do to replace Stefan Diggs. to, I don't think we expected it to happen this quickly, but he's really freaking talented. He's a first round pick for a reason. Um, I think he's the best first. I think he's, he is the best receiver in this rookie class bar none. Um, And there are four or five others taken before him. I mean, what did, what has Jalen Rieger done for the guy who's taken one pick before him at 21 for Philadelphia? I mean, absolutely nothing. Like if the Vikings really wanted him, um, you know, they lucked out essentially by having him taken off the board and then Jefferson fell to them at 22. So I'm not surprised by it just because we're seeing this every single week. And and look what happens. Every time you give him double digit figure, double digit targets, good things happen. Um, that has to stay consistent. That's the thing that I worry about reverting back to form when Thielen comes back or when you're going to, you know, if you get down in games and, you know, you're, you're into, you into asking Kirk to throw the ball 40, 45 times, like he had to do against Carolina to come back. Like Jefferson's got to be a part of that. He's got to be like a huge part of that. Like the part in, in my opinion, like I think he needs wide receiver one type targets. Like you can have Adam Thielen be your favorite guy in the red zone, your favorite set of hands, whatever. But like Justin Jefferson, you need to get both of those guys, similar workloads, in my opinion, to make sure that this offense can win without Dalvin cook and rest and kind of give him a little bit of a break but also to be successful against good teams. Like you're, you're not going to be able to run the ball effectively all like on the saints. And I don't think you're going to be able to do it that well on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the, the last drive of the game against the Panthers, what impressed me and where I think that they need to morph this thing a lot more probably. And this is going to get Kirk to buy in as well. Courtney is this BC Johnson is not bad. Mm-hmm. Like he's not a bad. So I well, would say, sure. I would say that as far as the distribution of the ball, to your point, Jefferson has to be involved more for sure. BC Johnson should be because we always talk talk about who's the third guy, right? And it's, it's, you know, Diggs and Thielen, Thielen and Jefferson. Hulk Hogan's the third guy. BC, BC Johnson, BC Johnson and Irv Smith. I really believe that this offense and Kirk in particular, if he is told what to do exactly, Um, can be a lot more effective and can cause defenses a lot of problems 
if they don't consistently know where the football is going to go. And so this is not saying mm -hmm. that that Thielen can't be a major part of the passing game because he certainly can. But it is saying that I think the Vikings need to rethink the distribution of the football. And we saw that against uh, the Panthers, got a taste of that. And I think it's actually a really good idea. No, I do too, but that's the problem with this team. They don't run a lot of three receiver sets, so you're not seeing all three of them out there at the same time. And even when they are, um, you know, running two wide receivers at a time, like it's Thielen and it's Jefferson. Like I think mixing other guys in there is a good. It's a good theory, Judd. I just we haven't seen it happen. Like this is a team that touts its wide receiver depth, but it's so it's such an anomaly because it's never used unless it's out of necessity when you don't have your top guy in Adam Thielen. Um, would I like to see that change? Yeah, but like I've been covering this team since 17. Every year, training camp, storyline, who's number three receiver? Doesn't matter. Like, I mean, you have these guys play such a like insignificant role throughout the season. I mean, even Mike Zimmer, you know, when people are lauding Chad Beebe for the quick turnaround from the muff punt to the game-winning touchdown, Zimmer's like, well, you know, he had to pump the brakes on putting him in Canton, but he did a good job on that play. And I honestly tend to agree with Mike. Like, you know, Chad Beebe is an occasional third down threat. That is pretty much what his role has become um, in this offense. Can he be bigger than that? Kirk Cousins is talking about the opportunities that, you know, how good Chad is when he actually gets the opportunities. I understand that, but I just won't believe that until I see it because it's just not something that they've ever really delegated to regularly. By the way, on that, on that muffed punt by Chad Beebe, I tend to agree with Randy and Cottage Grove. The football is oblong shaped. You know, you guys gotta, you gotta, you gotta. Kind of I think one job. On. It's hard to Look, catch it. It's one job. I'm calling eight and nineteen in my <laughs> office if I'm Coobs and I'm saying, boys, you're both important, but you're not as important as you think you are. We're going to do to Courtney's point more multiple mm -hmm. receiver stuff Be because the the thing is, think about the failure in Tennessee and Dallas, right? Think about the failure in what Kirk couldn't do at the end of both games. It's because mm -hmm. they knew damn well he was looking at one guy. And that's where I'm that's where I'm saying you've got you've got to tell Kirk, Kirk, we're taking one of your toys away to actually help you. Again, mm -hmm. there's an adult in each room and there's a bunch of children. And the children <laughs> need to be told what you're going to dictate. And Kubiak smart enough to do it. It just it drives me crazy. It, that the the uh end of game drill drives me absolutely nuts when we're sitting in that press box and everybody, you, me, uh, the two hundred fans, where it's going. We're all looking at number nineteen. Yep, it's You're not right. an answer. It's it, it's not acceptable. You know, I mean, come on, it's supposed to be pro football. I think you can probably bottle the film from the minute fifty-one no timeouts and say, listen, whether whether Thielen was here or not, this is the way you do it. You spread it around. You you yeah. don't key in, etc. And one more nugget uh, before we wrap this episode. So. On the subject of Justin Jefferson's targets, so he's putting up this historic rookie season, and 10 guys in the NFL have 900 receiving yards or more. Justin mm -hmm. Jefferson is one of those 10 guys. Basically, all of the other guys have 100 targets. Justin Jefferson has 72. Yeah, he's so he done it on such a eight yards for like 30 fewer targets than some of these other guys. It's ridiculous. Wild. No, I mean, I think it shows you how efficient he is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the 4 2 speed is really important. Like, four, yeah, he ran like a 4 four, three, I think it was at the combine. Like that's really, really important for these deep crossing routes and being able to be that deep vertical threat for Kirk cousins. Um, that's important. And I mean, I think that we need to see the level of Justin Jefferson that we saw against Carolina continue these next five weeks. Like that is going to be the key for them to win games. Yep. That's Courtney Cronin from ESPN.com. Mackie Judd Declan, you can find our other YouTube channel. If you're, if you're watching this or listening to this on the purple daily uh, feeds. So purple daily podcast, YouTube channel. Also, we launched another YouTube channel uh, a few months ago, youtube.com slash score North MN. And uh, we're almost to 2000 subscribers on that. So if you guys want to check out our other nonsensical ramblings and write that down predictions and Timberwolves discussions, Gerson Rosas was great yesterday. Check that out. We'll see you tomorrow on purple daily.